الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ وعلیٰ علیہ وصحاب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ومن احسن قول امی من ضوئی اللہ وام اللہ صلی ہوں قول ان المسلمین رب شلی صدری و صلی عمری وحل العقدت میں لسانی افکا وکاولی I welcome all the viewers I welcome all the viewers of the Peach TV network the Peach TV English the Peach TV Urdu the Peach TV Bangla and the Peach TV Chinese as well as the viewers on my four social media platforms which are the Facebook the YouTube the Instagram and Twitter I welcome all the viewers of the Islamic greetings assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. I welcome you to this program, Ask Dr. Zakir, Season 4, Session 3. I would like to inform you that for the next 7 to 8 session, Farik inshallah will not be taking part because he has his exams and his exams will be ending inshallah towards the end of the month of December. So inshallah when we have the first session in the month of January he will join us for the session till then <clears throat> he has taken a break so I'll be handling the session myself for one and a half hours in this program of Ask Dr. Zakir you're most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and compatible religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have asked and you were unable to reply or any question that is portrayed in the media regarding Islam, this is the opportunity. You can ask your question on any of my four social media platforms. But the best is, the best is that you ask your question on the WhatsApp as a text message. mentioning a question in brief along with your name your profession your city and country of origin to the whatsapp number plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five i repeat plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five We'll take the first question from the WhatsApp. The first question is Assalamu alaikum. I am Ali from Sri Lanka. I am a civil engineer currently in Qatar. Can we drink non-alcoholic beer? Brother Ali has asked the question that can we drink non-alcoholic beer? As far as drinking intoxicants are clear, as far as, as, far as drinking intoxicants are concerned, it is clearly mentioned in the glorious Quran. In Surah Maida, Chapter number 5, verse number 90, where Allah says, Ya ayyu allazina amanu, O you believe, inna mal khamru al maisuru, most certainly in toxicants and gambling. Wal ansabu al azamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rish sumun amili shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork, fash tanibul alukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. So this verse of the Quran, Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90, is very clear cut that any intoxicants, whether it be beer, whether it be alcohol, whether it be wine, any intoxicants, drugs, etc., it is prohibited. <clears throat> now the question posed is that is non-alcoholic beer allowed in Islam? First let us understand what is a non-alcoholic beer. In non-alcoholic beer, when you read on the can, it does not show any content of alcohol. But how is it made? We have come to know that the non-alcoholic beer 
it is made the same way as a normal beer is made, which contains alcohol with malt, with barley, and they cook it. But in a non-alcoholic beer, what they do, they extract the alcohol by various different methodologies. For example, the boiling point of normal water is 100 degrees centigrade. But the boiling point of ethanol, ethanol is ethyl alcohol or drinking alcohol, also known as spirit, also known as alcohol, it is at a lower degree. It is at 70 degrees centigrade. So when you boil below 100, above 78 degrees, up to 80 degrees, this ethanol is extracted, it evaporates. The other method of removing is by the osmosis method. But all these methods that are used by the companies which make the non-alcoholic beer, it does not remove 100% of the alcohol. They remove 95% of the alcohol. Yet 5% remains in that drink. Because to remove 100% of the alcohol is very expensive and these companies cannot afford. And according to the rules and regulation of the Food and Drug Association in USA, if the content is 5% and below, it need not be mentioned in the ingredients list on the can. So because the alcohol content in non-alcoholic beer is 5% or a little bit low, maybe 4.9 or 4.8%, they do not write in the can, but it does contain alcohol. Normally it contains 0.5% alcohol or 0.49% or alcohol. Because it contains 5% and less, by law, it need not be mentioned on the can, but it does contain alcohol. How did this come? This initially was first introduced in the early part of the 1900s, early part of the 20th century, when alcohol was banned in USA. So to circumambulate or to circumvent, avoid the law, what they used to do, they used to make the beer and extract the alcohol out. The content was 5%, so legally it was allowed. That's how it started initially. And but naturally later on, when alcohol was permitted in USA, they have gone back to drinking normal wine, whiskey, alcohol. But yet there are some people who yet have this non-alcoholic beer or alcohol-free beer. But let me tell you that this non-alcoholic beer or alcohol-free beer does contain alcohol it contains 0.5% or 0.49%. The normal beer, it contains approximately 5% of alcohol. It is less than the other drinks like whiskey, wine, etc. So, if we analyze, non-alcoholic beer does contain a small percentage of alcohol. The taste is same as beer. The effect in terms of fizziness etc is the same, the feeling in the mouth is the same. So those who drink normal beer feel non-alcoholic beer is somewhat similar. And unfortunately, there are some Muslims who think that this non-alcoholic beer is permitted. And there are fatwa by some scholars who have said it's permitted, which is totally wrong. Because they may fail to understand in which type was this non-alcoholic beer made. And just because it does not mention on the can that alcohol is not present, it doesn't mention in the can that alcohol is present. They think if no alcohol, that means it's permitted. But we have to realize that originally alcohol was there and alcohol was extracted and alcohol is yet there. Now when we come to know from the hadith of our beloved Prophet ﷺ, that once when a sahaba, he asked the Prophet that along with the orphans, we have inherited alcohol. So instead of throwing it away, can I convert it into vinegar? And the Prophet said, no, you throw it away. Now, if it was permitted, surely the Prophet would have said that, why waste it? Convert into vinegar and have it. And especially if it's the property of the orphans, all the more reason the Prophet would have been careful. But because he said, throw it away, that means once it contains alcohol, you cannot extract it and use it. So based on this hadith, it is very clear cut that once the drink contains alcohol, even if you extract the alcohol completely, you cannot have it. In this case, it is not extracted completely. So in the first case also it's haram, 
if it is extracted completely. In the second case, even though you extract it, yet it contains 0.5% alcohol. Now, if you compare to the effect of a normal beer, if you have one can of normal beer, it contains 5% alcohol. So, if you have 10 cans of non-alcoholic beer or alcohol-free beer, it will have the same effect as one can of normal beer. Or, if you have half a can of normal beer and have five cans of non-alcoholic beer, it will have the same effect. And a Prophet, peace be upon him, is very clear. It's mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Ibn Majah, or in Mufo, Hadith number 3392, that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anything which intoxicates in a small quantity, anything which intoxicates in a large quantity, it is also prohibited in a small quantity. So based on this Hadith, it is very clear cut that for a Muslim, having non-alcoholic beer is also prohibited. Number one, original contain alcohol, it is extracted. Number two, the complete alcohol is not extracted. So based on both of these evidences, it is very clear cut that a Muslim should not have non-alcoholic beer. Though the alcohol content is not mentioned on the can, it yet does contain alcohol, which if you have in large quantity, the non-alcoholic beer, it will have an intoxicating effect. Based on this, it is prohibited. Unfortunately, there are many Muslim countries, including many Gulf countries, where this is freely available and many Muslims think that it is permitted to have non-alcoholic beer. And once, when I was traveling in the plane, when I was traveling in the plane, coming back from Saudi Arabia, after doing Mumra, there was a Muslim sitting next to me and he was having beer. At the first instant, I thought he was not a Muslim. Maybe the non-Muslim having beer. But later on, he asked me to fill his immigration form. So when I read the immigration form, the name was Muhammad. So I asked him, you're a Muslim? He said, yes. Then how come you're having beer? He said, I have the same beer. He called it beer, even in Saudi Arabia. So there it's allowed, here also it's allowed. So that person, being a labor class, he thinks that the beer he was having non-alcoholic in Saudi Arabia is allowed. So here it is the same, the taste is same. And he had it, it is ignorance. So, I would say that non-alcoholic beer is haram. And I would really recommend that those which are Muslim majority countries, where the haram products are not allowed, we should see to it that even this non-alcoholic beer is prohibited in these countries because it is not permitted for a Muslim to have non-alcoholic beer or alcohol-free beer because it does contain alcohol and in large quantity it will intoxicate you. Hope that answers the question. The second question is from Max King. Is masturbation haram for teens? A similar question has been asked. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik. My name is Abdul Ghaniyu. I would like to know the ruling on masturbation. I traveled and left my family behind for greener pasture for about one and a half years now. I miss my wife very much. When I call her online for video chat, we sometimes end up with masturbation. I would like to know if this is sinful or not. A similar question is asked by a third questioner. Assalamu alaikum sir. I am Habibullah Islam from Assam, India. I am a student. Is masturbation haram in Islam? I do this and later I regret. I do Toba 
But after some days, I do it again. I can't find the solution to this problem. I am unhappy with masturbation and what I do. The question that is masturbation permitted in Islam is a very common question. And literally every session I have one or two people asking this question. But I've been trying to avoid answering this question. But today I decided that let me answer this question. As far as the act of masturbation is concerned, the scholars in Islam, there are different opinions. But the majority of the scholars, they say that masturbation in Islam is haram. Even though majority of the scholars say haram, there's a large number which also say that it is makhru. And there's another large number of scholars who say that it is muba, it's optional. So I would like to say at the outset that majority of the scholars in terms of percentage, majority, they say that it is haram. But a large number, there may not be majority, but the number is huge, a large number of scholars, they also say it is makru, it is discouraged. And another large number, though not in majority, they also say that it is muba. And we'll discuss this issue today. And I'll let you know that which group of scholars do I agree with towards the end. <coughs> as far <coughs> as far as the Shafi groups of scholars, the jurist, the fuqaha, amongst the Shafi and the Maliki, almost all of them they say that masturbation is haram. And according to Imam Ashafi, may Allah have mercy on him, he says it is haram and he quotes the verse of the Quran from Surah Al Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 5, 6, and 7. If you read Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 1 onwards, it says that believers will eventually be successful. Verse number 2 says, those who humble themselves in prayers. Verse number 3 says, those who avoid vain talks. Verse number 4 says, that those who do acts, deeds, who do acts and deeds of charity. Verse number 5 says, those who guard their private parts or those who abstain from sex. Verse number 6 says, except those who they have married, that is their spouses, that is their wives, and those would which those which their right hand possesses. For them, there is an exception. And verse number 7 says that all those who cross these limits, they are transgressors. So here the Quran says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 5, 6, and 7 that the moments are those who guard their private parts, abstain from illicit sex, except from their spouses and what their right hand possesses. That's an exception. And all those who cross these limits, they are transgressors. So based on this verse of the Quran, Imam Shafi, Allah will be with him, he says that here the verse is very clear cut, that sex you can only have with your spouse and what your right hand possesses and everything else is prohibited. Now this verse of the glorious Quran can be interpreted in two ways. The first group of scholars, they understand this verse as here guarding your private part in Arabic, it means that all types of sexual pleasures, all types of sexual pleasures, that means all types of sexual pleasures for a moment is only permitted with your wife and what your right hand possesses, that is the slave girl. And now the slave woman has been abolished. So now it is restricted to only your wives. So based on this verse, if all sexual pleasure is only permitted with your wife, then even masturbation is haram. Masturbation is stimulation of your organ 
and most of the time it is self-stimulation of your private part such that there is such that there is ejaculation or there is orgasm but the other group of scholars say that this verse guard your private part it only restricted to sexual intercourse so the verse of the quran actually means that you can have sexual intercourse only with your wife and what your right hand possesses other than sexual intercourse this verse doesn't refer to other things so if you agree with the second group of scholars then masturbation doesn't fall under this verse of the quran that is the reason the scholars are divided but if you literally know the verse of the quran the meaning it says guard your private part so but naturally there is no explicit verse in the quran which says that masturbation is prohibited and what we realize from this verse it means sexual intercourse and there are various other verses which has prohibited sexual intercourse with people outside the marital bonds or if they are not what your right hand possesses if they are not your slave women as allah says in the quran in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 32 come not close to adultery zina or fornication for it is an evil opening other roads to evil so based on this verse of the quran the other group of scholars they say that this verse specifically refers to sexual intercourse that means sexual intercourse is only permitted with your wife and with what your right hand possesses otherwise it doesn't mean other things so if you agree the meaning of this verse is only restricted to sexual intercourse then masturbation is not included in this verse so that is the reason scholars differ and according to ibn hazm he says that our beloved prophet has permitted a person to touch his private part and the hadith it says touch with your left hand no problem it is your organ you can touch he also says that it is your fluid you can emit it if you want so based on that he says when the prophet has permitted to touch your private organ and that is what you do in masturbation it is self stimulation so surely it is permitted and masturbation is of two type one is self stimulation the other type of masturbation is your spouse or your sexual partner is stimulating you and no scholar ever says that your wife or your spouse is not permitted to touch your private part so based on this surely the other type of masturbation where your spouse touches is permitted so when you can enjoy with your spouse touching a private part then why can't you do it yourself so based on this the second group of scholar which is lesser in number they say that this verse does not include masturbation at all it is just talking about sexual intercourse so sexual intercourse is only permitted with your wife with your spouse and with what your right hand possesses it doesn't include masturbation so that's how the scholars differ there is another argument given by the first group of scholars who say that masturbation is prohibited and they quote the verse they quote the hadith of our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is mentioned in sahih bukhari volume number 7 hadith number 5066 in which our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that o oh, young people whoever has the means to get married they should get married for it will help you to lower your gaze and guard your modesty guard your private parts and it continues those who cannot marry they should fast for it will reduce your sexual desire so here the first group of scholars they say fear the prophet said if you cannot marry you should fast the prophet did not say masturbation that is the reason masturbation is haram now this logic to say that just because the prophet did not say masturbate doesn't make masturbation haram yes what we have to understand from this hadith that the young people should marry if they can if they can marry they should fast that means fasting is mustahab no way does it mean that masturbation is haram because it's not mentioned as haram suppose if i say that eat date it's good for nourishment and for energy and if the prophet says eat date that does not mean eating mango is haram it means eating date is good in mustahab the other fruits become muba so it is wrong to conclude from this hadith of sahih bukhari that masturbation is haram it is wrong logic because for haram there should be strong evidence from the quran or from sahih hadith 
So based on this, the second group of scholars who say it is not haram, they say there is no text at all anywhere in the Quran. This is the only verse which the scholars quote of Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 5 to 7, which they say it doesn't include masturbation. There is no clear-cut evidence. It only speaks about sexual intercourse. And there is no say hadith prohibiting masturbation. There are some daif and maudu hadith which say masturbation is not prohibited, but that is not good enough for evidence. So we come to the second group of scholars and we'll discuss what they say. They believe that masturbation is makhru. Amongst them is Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, who was the companion of the Prophet. There is a person who comes to him and says that I have been masturbating. He says that masturbation is better than fornication. Marriage is better than masturbation. That means the call, the verdict of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be peace with him, who was a close companion of the Prophet Muhammad According to him, marriage is better than masturbation, masturbation is better than fornication. Indirectly, it means that surely masturbation is permitted, but it is makhru. The best is marriage. If you cannot marriage, then masturbate, because it will prevent you from fornication. So based on this, the second group of scholars who say masturbation is permitted but comes in the makhru category is Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. He is of the opinion that masturbation should not be done but if you are going to do fornication then you can do masturbation and he puts it in the makhru, makhru category. So the humbly school of thought, most of them they say that masturbation comes un under the makru category. That means it's discouraged. And this is also said by Mujahid. He says that masturbation, is, it should be avoided. But if it's done to prevent fornication or zina, it is permitted. This is the view even of Ibn Hazm. That Ibn Hazm says that masturbation is makru, it's discouraged. But if it, if it, you are going to involve in fornication, then better do masturbation. It is permitted in such cases. And he says that though masturbation is permitted, it is not amongst the deeds of the noble people. It is not the deeds of nobility. That was his saying, Ibn Hazm. That means the noble people normally do not do it, so it is discouraged. So that is the reason this group of scholars puts it in the Makru category. There are other, there are many other scholars in this category. Time will not permit to discuss that. The third group of scholars, they put in the Muba categories. The students of Ibn Abbas, some of the students they understood that Ibn Abbas has put masturbation in the Makru category and even they say it is Makru. But the, but the other group of students of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, they said that it is Muba, permitted, without any condition. Amongst them, we have Jafar, Jafar bin Zaid. He was a Tabayin, may Allah have mercy on him. And he was a student of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him. And his opinion is that masturbation is permitted. There is no harm at all in doing. It is Muba. There is no sin. Under normal circumstances, permitted. There is another Tabain by the name of Amr bin Dinar. According to him also, masturbation is permitted. There is no restriction. It comes under the Muba category. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. It is in the Muba category. Even the famous scholar Ashokani, Imam Ashokani, he is very famous. Just 150-200 years back he was there. And according to him also, masturbation is Muba. It is permitted. It is optional. If you want to do it, do it. There is no sin. If you don't do it also, there is no problem. It is under the Muba category. And even according to Bardavi, he says that according to him, masturbation is makru, but depending upon the situation, if it causes you trouble, it, it becomes in the Muba category. And he also goes on to say that 
if you fear you will do fornication, masturbation becomes further. That is his opinion. So here you have three groups of scholars. One group which is a majority saying it is haram, based on the verse of Surah Mominun, chapter number 23, verse number 5 and, five and 7, 5 to 7. Whereas the second group of scholars say it is makru, it is discouraged. And the third group say it is muba, it is permissible, it depends upon you. According to me, I being a medical doctor, that in our medical college when I did my medicine, they used to say that when you ask a person, do you masturbate? 99% will say yes. And the remaining 1%, they are lying. Anyway, this is just a joke. It's amongst the medical student. It's not a fact. But according to research, today research tells us that amongst the male, 95% masturbate. Amongst the female, approximately 80% masturbate. I'm not saying that it is normal to masturbate, but it is very common. And there is a myth that which is there if you go to some of the Islamic sites and those who believe it's haram, they say that masturbation causes blindness, masturbation, it causes nervous problem. All these things are a myth. In no way does masturbation cause blindness. In no way does it cause a nervous problem. Yes, if you do excessive masturbation, there can be certain problem that is excessive masturbation. And even medical science tells us, if you do ex excessive sexual intercourse with your wife, maybe 10 times a day, even that will cause problem. So excessive anything or excessive most of the things will cause you problem. But normal masturbation medically doesn't cause any problem. If you do masturbation according to medical science, it is normal. If you don't do also, it is normal. But the majority of the people are involved in masturbation. But I'm not saying it is the norm, but I'm saying that majority people do it. So based on what, what the scholars say and what medical science says, I agree more with the second group of scholars and I would say that masturbation is makru, it is discouraged. To make anything haram, you require a strong evidence from the Quran or from Sahih Hadith and there is no evidence whatsoever. The verse of the Quran, I do agree with the second group of scholars, for example, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, may Allah be pleased with him and the other group of scholars, Ibn Abbas, may Allah, uh, may Allah be pleased with him. I believe with Ibn Abbas call that it is not haram. And this verse of Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 5 to 7, does not include masturbation. It's not prohibited. It is restricted to sexual intercourse. And I put it, because there's no evidence, it will either come in the Mubah, I put in the Makru because I agree with the call of Ibn Hazm that it is not the act of nobility. It's not the norm, but because majority of human beings are involved in it and there is no evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah to prohibit it, I put in the makru category. Everything the majority do is not correct. For example, today, according to, according to research, 95% of the women in the Western country, before they pass the university, they are involved in zina. That does not make zina halal, not at all. The Quran is very clear cut in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse number 32 that zina is prohibited, it is haram. Majority do doesn't give it a sanction to make it halal, but if there is no text in the Quran or Sahih Hadith prohibiting it, it becomes muba. I put it into the makru category for various reasons. One of the reasons is it's not the act of the noble people. Number two, that excessive masturbation is haram. It can cause problems, it can cause health problems, it can cause problems in psychological and most of the time masturbation is associated with haram activities. Most of the time masturbation is associated with pornography, whether you are watching a blue film or a pornographic film or you are watching obscene photographs, images. Here itself if it is associated with haram activity that again becomes haram. So if you associate masturbation with pornography or with obscene photographs, it is haram and that is prohibited and it leads to that high chances. That's the reason I would say that best is to avoid. But if you cannot marry for various reasons that we have, 
So the best would be you fast, as was recommended by the Prophet, as was recommended by beloved Prophet in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, hadith number 5066, that, O oh, young people, whoever has the means to get married, they should get married. For it will help you to lower your gaze and guard your modesty. And if you cannot marry, then you fast, it will reduce sexual power. And this is scientifically proven that if you fast, it reduces your urge of your sexual desires. So the best is to fast. But you may not, it may not be possible to fast always. And depending upon the levels of sexual urge, it keeps on differing. So based on this, the mustab is to fast. But if you cannot, or if that's not sufficient to suppress your desire, and if you have to masturbate, it is permitted. It is not a sin. There is no evidence anywhere in the Quran or Sahih Hadith which says that if you masturbate, you will get a punishment. Here, the reason I am saying this, that I being a medical doctor, I know that there are many Muslims, many of them, hundreds, who have come to me for consultation. And they believe because of the views of most of the Muslims, they are good practicing Muslim, but they believe it is haram. So they come to me and the similar what question was asked that he is tensed, he is unhappy and he has got mental stress because they are good practicing Muslim, they pray five times Salah, but they realize and they think masturbation is haram. So they get tensed up and worked up. And this causes many a times big problem. Because they think it is haram and they are doing it and they have the guilt feeling, this guilty conscious prevents them sometimes or many a times even to do good deeds. It disturbs them in the salah, it disturbs them in the reading of the Quran. So because of not knowing the fact what is there in the medical science today, these people think it's haram, it disturbs them. So I would like to tell you that I am not giving a blanket rule that do it. I am just telling you best avoid it. But if you have sexual urges which you cannot suppress, doing masturbation is not haram according to me, it is permissible. Don't do it excessively. Once in a while, no problem. Don't be mentally disturbed that it's haram. And as the questioner asked, I have asked for forgiveness. Again I do it. I repent. Again I do it. So let me tell you that if you come under this category where you have sexual desire that keeps on differing from different people. Some people have high sexual desire, some people are medium, some people have less. So if you fall in the category of people who have high sexual desire and if you are not married and if you have to masturbate, though it is makru, I would say it's discouraged, but don't have the guilt feeling, don't do it excessively, don't do it along with pornography. And I would go to the extent that if because of this you are going to do fornication or zina, or adultery, it is better, then according to me, masturbation becomes mustahab. And as is mentioned by Imam Ibn Hanbal and Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, that masturbation is better than fornication. So normally according to me, I would like to repeat, I am not giving a blanket permission all of you should do. I, according to me, masturbation comes in the makru category, best is to avoid it. If you have the urge and if you are not married, better that you fast. If the urge is yet there, then masturbation is permitted. There is no sin, there is no punishment, you don't have to feel guilty. And if you have the urge and if you think you will do fornication, then better do masturbation and avoid fornication and marry as soon as possible. We know that masturbation differs in different people, even after marriage. Masturbation, majority of the people masturbate, 70% of the males after marriage they masturbate. But of course, by age it keeps on reducing, marriage also reduces, the more sexual intercourse you have, it reduces. So, this is my view regarding masturbation, it is makru. Avoiding is the best. Next option is fasting. If you yet have the urges, then it's permissible, don't have the guilt feeling, and see to it that you practice and stay on the Quran and Sunnah, or for your salah and do your ibadah and inshallah pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he keeps you on the straight path. Hope that answers the question. Uh, 
on the Facebook we have We have Masood Masood Rana, Aditya Bagas, Muhammad Usman, Arif Sayyid, my M. Hamza Rajput, love you sir, Momin Hussain from Bangladesh, Zakirullah, Ahsan Tusar, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam, A. Majid F, Salam from Pakistan, wa alaikum salam, Naik Azhar, Mizanur Rahman Sujon, Salam from Bangladesh, Walaikum Salam, Epic Hunter Tanmoy, Al Nahiyan Sarkar, Tajuddin Laskar, Sushanta Biswas, Selina Khatun, Love You Sir, from Bangladesh, Muhammad Saddam Hussein, Love You, I Love You Too, Amar English, Ishaq Suleiman Maigari, we miss you. Mujibur Rahman Shahjan. Mama Sasa from Indonesia. Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. Khaikum Khan, love you sir, I love you too. Abdul Alim Khan, love from India. I love you too. Muhammad Shabir, I really miss you sir from India. Hafizur Rahman Runyal. Parvez Khan. Wasi Wasi. Many people are doing du'as and I do du'as for you too. We have on the YouTube Sajid Ahmed Mujahid Hamza Akram Rosh Kutan Munib Chicken Munis Nabi Fanex Mafia Sajid Ahmed Mansur Ali Khan Ibrahim Hamadi, John Peter, Umair Sheikh, Qasim Siddiqui, Sadiqa Tasneem, Anas Khalid, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salaam, All of the Indwaz, I do dua to you also. <clears throat> the next question Assalamu alaikum Zakir Naik My name is Hussein Muhammad from Cameroon, Africa Sir, I am suffering from urine inconsistency It is very difficult for me to be changing my clothes every prayer and every time I want to make wudu it comes out. I am in a very difficult situation, sir. Please tell me what to do. A similar question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Firoz Kazi. I am from Cape Town, South Africa. I have irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, and I keep on passing wind at irregular intervals. Many a times after I do wudu, I pass wind. Is my salah valid? The question posed by the brothers is that he has, he passes urine. He has inconsistency in the passing of urine, dribbling of urine, and the other person passes wind regularly. So, how will you offer Salah? 
It keeps, the wudu keeps on breaking. The reply to this is given in the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, volume number one, hadith number two to eight, that Fatima bint Abi Hubaish, Fatima bint Abi Hubaish, may Allah be pleased with her, she approaches the Prophet and she tells the Prophet that I have been having a regular vaginal bleeding. Should I stop my prayers forever? And the Prophet tells her that this vaginal bleeding which is continuous is not your menstrual blood. Whenever you have your regular menstrual period, at that time you stop praying. The moment the menstrual period is over, you have a bath, you wash yourself, you do wudu and you pray your salah. And when you offer the next salah, again you do a new wudu. This similar message is even given in the hadith of Sai Muslim, point number one, hadith number 753, Hadith Aisha Mella be with her. She said that she heard from the same Sahabiya, Fatima bint Abi Hubaish, that she told the Prophet that she has vaginal bleeding continuously, she should she stop Salah? And the Prophet said, this bleeding is from a vein. It is not your menstrual blood. So when you have your regular menstrual period, at that time you start praying. When your menstrual period ends, have a bath, do wudu and pray. And when the next salah comes, again do wudu and pray. So based on this hadith, the scholars, they say that similar condition for inconsistency urine, inconsistency in urine, where there's dribbling of urine, where you keep on passing urine regular intervals, or if you are passing wind, or if you are emitting muddy or prostatic fluid at regular intervals, all these cases, all this bleeding regularly from the nose, etc. In these conditions, the same ruling will apply what is there for the continuous vaginal bleeding which is a non-menstrual bleeding. And here the scholars say that when the time for Salah is there, when the time for Salah starts, at that time you can wash your private part, do wudu and you offer the Salah. Now when you offer the Salah during that time, if the urine comes or if the wind passes, your Salah is accepted. But when the next Salah comes, you again do a fresh wudu, again wash your part, Again, do a fresh wudu and you offer salah. During the time when you're offering salah, as long as you're done wudu at the start of the salah, when the salah, starts, when the salah time starts, you wash your part, do wudu. After that, when you pray your faraz or your nafil or your sunnah, and if, if you pass urine or pass wind or bleeding is there, your salah is accepted. In this case, there are two views. One group of scholars says that the wudu is valid till the next salah starts based on the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. The other group of scholars says no, the wudu is valid till the end of the salah, till the end of the salah time. Now, and it's not valid till the start of the next salah. Now these two views, the difference is that if you do wudu for fajr salah, when the time for fajr adhan is there. The moment you hear the adhan, after that, you wash your private part, you do wudu, you offer your fajr salah, do the sunnah, fajr salah in congregation, no problem. But if you want to offer your salat al duha, which is after sunrise, the first group of scholars who say that your salah is valid till the start of next salah, that is the zohar salah, they say you need not do wudu again and need not wash your private part again. But the second group of scholars, which is more correct, they say that no, the time for Fajr is over, the sun has risen. If you want to offer Salat al Dua, make a fresh wudu, wash your private part, make a fresh wudu, and then your Salah will be valid. I believe that it's better to be safe. And I believe in the second group of scholars that for every Salah time, and since the Fajr Salah is over, if you want to offer Salat al Dua, then you wash yourself again, 
do a fresh wudu and then you do that is the best similarly if you after isha you want to offer tahajjud and while offering tahajjud while offering qiyamul layl or tahajjud it is past midnight the salah time for isha is up to midnight in nisful layl so if you are continuing your salah after midnight it is preferable and rather a requirement that you do new wudu wash your private parts again do wudu that is the best because the qiyamul layl or tahajjud after the nisful layl the time for isha is over so the wudu is not valid this is difference of opinion and this is according to Ahmed ibn Hanbal may Allah be pleased with him that may Allah have mercy on him this is opinion when this question was asked to Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salah al-Taymin ibn al-Taymin he said that that when a person asks that I keep on passing urine regularly and my wudu breaks so how should I offer salah so the reply he gave is that inconsistency of urine is of two types one is it keeps on coming every few minutes the moment it enters the urinary bladder it comes out or rather call it dribbling of urine the other type of inconsistency is that when the bladder is full and you urinate then there urine does not come out for maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes so if you fall in the second category type of people where once you go to the toilet once you empty your bladder then at least for 15 minutes or 20 minutes there is no urination then it is preferable you empty your bladder and then offer salah or even if you have to wait for emptying your bladder wait even if you miss your salah, no problem, it is better. Empty your bladder, then you wash yourself, do wudu and pray, that is the best. But if you fall in the first category of people, where the urine keeps on coming out every few minutes, or dribbling of urine is there, then in this case, the moment the time for salah starts, after you hear the adhan, you wash yourself, do your wudu and keep a cloth close to your private part so that while you're offering salah the urine doesn't spill it doesn't uh, spoil your clothes doesn't come out on the musalla keep a cloth and you offer salah even if the urine comes out in between no problem you can offer your nafil you can offer your sunnah you can offer your faraiz you can join the jama it is accepted this wudu is valid till the end of the prayer time if you're offering fajr then from the fajr adhan till the sun starts rising or if you're offering dohar after the sun reaches its highest point after a few minutes till just before the adhan of asar so for the full time it's valid your wudu is valid when this question was asked to sheikh bin baz may Allah have mercy on him that it's difficult for me to keep on change is it a, it is a must to keep on changing clothes when you're offering salah after the urine comes out it's difficult so bin baaz may Allah be <laughs> may Allah have mercy on him he said that it is preferable that once you wash your part and once you do wudu your, your clothes should be clean and after that if you offer salah, the clothes get dirty, wear clean clothes, wash yourself, wear clean clothes, it's the best. But if you cannot, it's not possible you can do it always, then even if you do with the dirty clothes, as long as you wash yourself, you do a fresh wudu and you pray, it's accepted. And there are many scholars, including Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, may Allah have mercy on him, he says that if there are problems for a person to do wudu and wash very often, you can join your prayers. You can join your asar. You can join your zohar and asar together and pray any time from the start of zohar salah till the end of asar salah both together. Or you can also join your maghrib and isha salah together. If you have problems of doing wudu again or washing your clothes, it's difficult. Joining the salah is permitted in such cases. And so this ruling based on the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim 
for a lady who has vaginal bleeding, it is not the menstrual cycle. It is applicable for people who have inconsistency in urine or doubling of urine or passing of wind or continuous bleeding, all these cases. And I would like to say that if you have inconsistency of urine, that nowadays you have adult diapers. So my advice to you would be that after you wash your part, your private part, and when you do wudu, you can wear a male diaper, an adult diaper. The adult diaper is very convenient. It's the best. There are good quality which is expensive. You can't afford, you can buy the cheap quality. And even if you are praying five times a day, you may have to change the diaper five times. Or if you're offering Salat or Dua, then six times. If you're even offering Qayyam uh, uh, maximum seven times. So if you have seven diapers, adult diapers, it solves your problem. It will be very clean. There's no soiling of urine. So now the facility is there. So best would be you wash yourself, wear and do wudu, wear a male diaper. It's very convenient. It is the best. If you can't afford even a cheap diaper and you're very poor, then you can keep a napkin or a cloth and that will solve your problem. It will prevent soiling but may not be very convenient. In this way, inshallah, you can offer your five times salah, you can offer salat al-duha, you can offer even your tajud or qayamul layl and surely all your salah, as long as you do a fresh wudu at the start of the time of salah and you wash your part and do fresh wudu, it is valid till the end of the time of that salah. And your salah would be valid. Hope that's the question. Shahid Ghazi on the Facebook, Ibrahim Ahmed, Mashallah, Muhammad Minarul, Kais Nurzai, Salam, Walikum Salam, Moshir Taim, love you, sir. Zeb Chaudhary, Assalamu Alaikum, Walaikum Salaam, Iram Mashood, Farik Khan, Faik Khan, Muhammad Bayazid, Shakil Ahmed, Assalamu Alaikum, Walaikum Salaam, Walaikum Salaam, Walaikum Salaam, Walaikum Salaam, Walaikum Salaam, Muhammad Magbul Dar, Shahid Akhtar, Love You Sir, I Love You Too, Nabil Hussain, Umair Ahmed Fadiullah, Umair Ahmed Fadiullah, you help me, sir. Jazakallah. Muhammad Shifat Hussain Khan, Shtimi Khargur, Afrin Bari. You have on the YouTube Muhammad Mizba. Muhammad Mustaq, Muhammad Sohail, Sirajuddin Ibrahim, Naima Khatun. Sheikh Naushad, Zigon Abdul Aziz, The Family, Nas Tabassum, Sirajuddin Ibrahim, Nafiz, Abdullah Mubarak Khan, Ahmed Najma, The next question. Adil Bareilly, Uttar Pradesh, India. Is every hadith in Bukhari authentic? If yes, then can it be compared to the Quran? A similar question is asked by Shadab Khatri, London, UK. Are all the hadith in Siya Sitta Sahih? A similar question by Suleiman Khan, Birmingham, UK. What are the criteria that make a hadith Sahih? Are all the Sahih hadith of the same level? Why is Sahih Bukhari so special? So the three questions I've clubbed together talking about Sahih Bukhari and the criteria that make hadith Sahih and what makes Bukhari 
special regarding the first question that are all the hadith in say Bukhari authentic and can be compared to the Quran yes all the hadith in Sahih Bukhari authentic there are 6,563 hadith in Sahih Bukhari and all of them authentic can be compared to the Quran the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Quran is verbatim the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through Archangel Gabriel then the scribes the sahabas they wrote down and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam checked it up personally he asked them to recite it he checked it if there was a mistake he corrected it and Prophet peace be upon him used to rehearse it to, uh, with Archangel Gabriel every Ramadan and the last Ramadan before he, di before he died he rehearsed it twice so that means the Quran is 100% the worst word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala verbatim revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Prophet dictated to the Saba, they wrote it down, he counter-checked it, he revived it with Archangel Gabriel. So, Quran is verbatim, word to word, without a difference even of a letter. The word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As far as Sayyid Bukhari is concerned, it is the most authentic book amongst all the books of Hadith, the highest level. But the Hadith are the things of the Prophet and his actions. Some hadith are verbatim words, but the others are meaning wise. They are not verbatim the word of the Prophet. And they were heard by the Sahabas, Sahabas memorized it, then the Tabain, Tabe Tabain, and the chain of narrators. So it is not of that. Love the Quran is the highest level, it is the verbatim word of God. The hadith are the sayings of the Prophet. <coughs> if it's a say hadith, we believe in it, we have to follow it. But natural Quran is number one. Then comes the Sahih Hadith. In Sahih Hadith, the highest is Sahih Bukhari. And it's an ijma amongst the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah scholars, among the Sunni scholars, that after the Book of Allah, after the Quran, the next in authenticity, the next to be followed is Sahih Bukhari. There's no doubt about it. Doubt about it. The second most important book of Islam, it is Sahih Bukhari. <clears throat> Come to the second question that are all the hadith in siyasat authentic? Siyasatta is actually a misnomer. Siyasatta means six sahi. It should be kutubu sitta. It is six books of hadith. So kutubu sitta is the right terminology for six books of hadith. Siyasatta is a misnomer. Siyasatta means six authentic books the right terminology is kutub sitta six books of hadith and this kutub sitta are the sahih bukhari sahih muslim sunan abu daud sunan tirmidhi sunan nisai and ibn majah these six books the scholars they say that if you read this six books of hadith you will come to know most of the rulings in Islam. But the hadith in all the six books are not 100% authentic. The only book in which all the hadith are authentic and say is Sahih Bukhari number one, then is Sahih Muslim. The remaining four books, Sunan Abu Dawud, Sunan Tirmidhi, Sunan Nisai, and Ibn Majah, in these four books, most of the hadith is Sahih, but not all 100%. So these six books the scholars say, if you read and you read the Quran, you will come to know most of the rulings in Islam. Most of it. Not 100%, but most of it. There is a small group of scholars who say that instead of Ibn Majah, there should be Imam, Imam Mu'at Tamalik. So there is another small group of scholars who say the six books should contain, besides Bukhari, Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, Say Muslim, Sunnah Abu Dawood, Sunnah Nisai, Sunnah Tirmidhi, it should contain Imam Mu'at Tamalik, instead of Ibn Majah. That's a small group. But we agree that six books are there. If you want to join Imam Mu'at Tamalik, it becomes seven. 
But most of the scholars say that Ibn Majah is included in this. So all the hadith of it, of these six books are authentic. Only the first two, Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari, all authentic. The remaining four, majority authentic, but not all. There is a great scholar of the recent time, a muhaddis, that is Nasruddin al-Bani. What he did, he has divided the last four books of Qutb al-Sitta into Sahih and Zaif. He wrote this is Sahih and he differentiated the books of Hadith, the last four books, Sunan Abu Dawud, Asai Sunan Abu Dawud, Zayf Sunan Abu Dawud. Then he took the next book, Sunan Nisai, Sai Sunan Nisai, Zayf Sunan Nisai. Then he took the next book, Sunan Tirmidhi, Sai Sunan Tirmidhi, Zayf Sunan Tirmidhi. Then they took the last book, Ibn Majah. Sai Ibn Majah, Zayf Ibn Majah. So the Sisra is Sahih. So if you read this Silsala Sahih of Sheikh Nasr al-Albani, then you can come to know which all the Sahih Hadith in the last four books of Qutb al-Sitta. He's done a great work. So this is how you can differentiate. Come to the third question, that what are the criteria for Hadith to be Sahih? And what is so special about, about Sahih Bukhari? And what are the categorizations of hadith? As far as classification and categorization of hadith is concerned, it is called as mustala hadith, that is the science of hadith. The Muhaddisins have classified hadith into very different categories. The three more important classifications, I'll tell you, there are many classifications. One is based on who is the original narrator. And according to Ibn Salah, he has classified the hadith into who is the originator. And number one, the highest, hadith e qudsi It goes up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it says that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it goes up to Allah. It starts with the narrator, goes to the sahaba, goes to the prophet, and prophet said Allah said, that becomes hadith e qudsi the highest category. Number two is the marfu hadith. The hadith which reaches, marfum is raised. It reaches to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A chain of narrators are there, then it says the Sahaba name says that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. So that becomes marfu. The third category is mawkuf, means top. It goes to the level of the tabain. No, so it goes to the level of the Sahaba. So if the hadith goes to the level of Sahaba, but doesn't reach the level of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is called as mawkuf. That is stopped. That is the third level. The fourth is the maktu, means cut off. It reaches to the tabain. So if it reaches to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's called hadith e qudsi. Reaches to the prophet, it's called as marfu hadith. Reaches to the saba, it is called as mawkuf. If it reaches to the tabain, that is the next generation after the saba, it is called as maktu. So this classification is based on who is the original narrator. One type of classification. The second type of classification, according to Ibn Salah, is based on the number of chain of narrators. Number of chain of narrators. And it is divided into two types. The Mutawatir Hadith and the Ahad Hadith. In the Mutawatir Hadith, there are umpteen, there are several number of narrators. The number is not specified. It says several at every stage. And this Mutawatir Hadith is divided into two further. Mutawatir in terms of wordings, Mutawatir in terms of meaning. I'll give you an example. In terms of Mutawatir, in terms of wording. That means all the Hadith that you find, the wordings are exactly the same. And Mutawatir means at every stage, there are various narrators. Like at the Sahaba level, there are various Sahabas who narrated it. Then there are various other people who narrated from the Sahabat and the next level and the third level. One example is a very famous Mutawatir Hadith, which is a Hadith Mutawatir in words. That our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anyone who deliberately or purposefully tells a lie in my name, he prepares his seat in the hellfire. 
Now this hadith, the words are same, but natural Arabic. This is the English translation which may differ. But in Arabic, the words are the same. It was narrated by no less than 74 sahabas. 74 different sahabas narrated this hadith that they said that they heard the Prophet say this. 74. Now, in the next level, you have much more than 74 people who have narrated it. The sahabas, each sahaba may have narrated it to many other people. So, in the second level, you have more than 100 of narrators. Then third level, you have another few hundred narrators. So overall, there are hundreds of people who have narrated this hadith. And all those who have narrated, the words are exactly the same. So the scholars of hadith, they say, it cannot be possible that hundreds of people are narrating exactly the same words. It has to be correct. There is no difference of opinion that this uh, these are verbatim the words of the beloved Prophet Muhammad. So many narrators at every level. That means the minimum narrators of this hadith are 74. Next level there are more than 74. Third level more than that. So minimum. So if, if there are minimum several narrators at each level, then the hadith is called mutawatir. If the words are same, it's called mutawatir in words. Let's come to the second example. Mutawatir in meaning. The hadith of the Prophet Muhammad when he said that for Fajr Salah there are two rakat, there are four rakat for the Zohar Salah, Asar Salah, Nisha Salah and for Maghrib Salah there are three rakat. There are various narrators at each level, umpteen number of narrators. Many sahabas who narrated it followed by Madhubi. But the words kept on differing. But the meaning was the same. Though the words differed, the meaning was the same, that in Fajr there was two rakat, in, As in Zohar, Asar and Isha there was, in Zohar, Asar and Isha there were four rakat to be prayed and the Maghrib three rakat. So here the Muhaddisin say it is mutawatir in meaning. Meaning is the same, the words may differ. So this was the type of mutawatir hadith, two types. In the Ahad hadith, it is further divided into three types of hadith. One is mashur, second is aziz, and third is gharib. Now all the Ahad hadith, they do not meet the criteria of mutawatir. The highest level of Ahad hadith is the mashur, that minimum three or more narrators have narrated at each level. That means minimum number of narrators at each level, if there are three, then it is called as a mashur hadith. That means that minimum three sahabas have narrated it. Then the tabain may be more than three, but if minimum three is there at each level, it is called as mashur hadith or even more than three. It can be four also, yet it's called a mashur hadith. If it is several then it becomes a mutawatir. But if it's three at each level or four at each level, it is called as a mashur hadith. It is the highest in terms of ahad hadith. The second level in ahad hadith is the aziz hadith. In aziz hadith, there are minimum two narrators at each level. It is the chain of narrators. And minimum two sabas have narrated it. And at the other levels also two or more have continued with the chain. So that's called uh, Aziz Hadith. The third category of Aziz Hadith is the Garib, only one chain. That means at any one stage, only one person. Other stages, there may be 10, 20, no problem. And the best example is the Hadith of Bukhari, which was narrated by the Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Innamal bil amalami, innamal amala bin niya, that your actions are based on your intention. All the hadith, there are hundreds of hadith, all hadith that are there, it goes to Hazrat Umar, may Allah be peace with him. Says, Umar, may Allah be peace with him, said that the Prophet said. Below, after Hazrat Umar, may Allah be peace with him, there are many narrators. But at one stage, there is only one narrator. No other sahaba besides Hazrat Umar narrated this. So this becomes a ahad, a gharib hadith. It's a sahih hadith. It is there in Bukhari. It's a Sahih Hadith, but it is a Ahad Hadith and a Garib Hadith. All the chains, 
reach to Hazrat Umar may Allah peace with him. There is no other Sahabi who, there is no other Sahaba who narrated this. So this is called as Ahad Karimati, Ahad and Karimati. So this was the second type of classification based on number of narrators. There are various classifications. I'll just go come to the main one which we are discussing. The third type of classification of Hadith is based on authenticity. In this type of classification, there are two types of Hadith. One is Maqbul, accepted, and the other is Mardud, which is rejected. In the accepted type of Hadith, there are two types of Hadith. Sahih Hadith and Hassan. In the Sahih Hadith, what are the criteria for Sahih Hadith? There are basically five criteria for a Hadith to be Sahih. Number one, the narrator should be of good character. That means he should be honest, he should be truthful, he should not lie, he should not cheat, he should be of good character. That is called the first criteria. Number two, he should be of, of very good memory so that he can repeat what he has heard of the Prophet. Or according to Ibn Salah, it can also be that what he heard from the Prophet, he remembers it and he writes it down and then if required, he can again read it. Even that's accepted. The second category is the memory should be very good. You can repeat it at any time or at least remember it till the time he writes it. The third category is, the, sorry, the third criteria for Hadith to be Sahih is that there should be a continuous chain of narrators. There should be consistency. I cannot say that I heard from my great grandfather. If my great grandfather died before I was born, how can I say I heard from my great great grandfather? So there should be a continuous chain of narrators. All the narrators should be from one, they should have met each other and personally heard from them. The fourth criteria is that there should not be any flaw. I'll give you an example of a flaw that two contemporary narrators who lived at the same time, if one chain of narrators says that narrator A heard from narrator B and according to the Rijal, the history, we know that these two narrators, though they lived at the same time, but they never met. So how can narrator A hear the hadith from narrator B when they did not meet. So this is a flaw. So there should not be any flaw. And the fifth, fifth criteria for hadith to be say is that it should not contradict with any other sound hadith. Any other hadith which is sound, which is sahih, if it contradicts, then it is wrong. So it should not contradict with any other sound hadith, any other sahih hadith or hasan hadith. So there are basically five criteria for hadith to be say. Number one, the narrator should be of a good character. Number two, of good memory. Number three, there should be continuity in the chain of narrator. The sanat should be there. Number four, there should not be irregularities or flaws. Number five, it should not contradict any other sound hadith. If all these five criteria are met, it is called a say hadith. If there is a slight flaw in any of these, then the hadith become hasan. But it is accepted. It is Maqbool. In the Sahih Hadith, there are two types of Hadith. That is the Sahih Hadith with continuous chain and Sahih Hadith with a broken chain. In the Hassan again, there are two types. Hassan Hadith with, with a continuous chain and Hassan Hadith with a broken chain. So these are the categories of the Maqbool Hadith, accepted Hadith. If it falls under Sahih or Hassan, it is accepted as a hujja, as an argument for you to accept it. If it's a Hasai hadith or Hasan hadith, and if the Prophet has prohibited, it becomes haram for you. If the Prophet has commanded you, it becomes compulsory for you, or it becomes mustab for you. The second category is hadith which are zaif or modu. Zaif has again got various categories zaif, zaif, jiddan, zaif because of the character because of the continuous of the chain of narrator zaif because of inconsistency in the narrator various there are multiple different types of zaif the time will not permit to go into detail same with maudu there are different types so basically 
The third type of classification based on authenticity and there are other classification also makes a hadith which is maqbool, hadith which is mardud that is rejected. Now the question also asks one more question that are all the say hadith of same category? That means all the hadith which are maqbool are they of same category? No. There are levels. And I remember when one of my first teachers of hadith, that is Sheikh Ziyar Rahman asked me, may Allah grant him Jannah, he was the head of and the dean of the department of hadith in the Islamic University of Medina and he expired just a few months back on the day of Arafah on the 30th of July, just three months back and may Allah grant him Jannah Firdos. He was my first teacher in hadith and he said that there are 10 categories, levels of Maqbul hadith. Eight categories of Sahih and two of Hassan. Sahih Bukhari. Sahih Bukhari, Imam Bukhari, in his Jame Sahih, he put additional criteria for making a hadith Sahih. Besides the five criteria which I discussed, Imam Bukhari put in additional criteria which are more stricter. Then only said I will include in my Jame Sahih. I'll give you an example. Normally for hadith to be sahih, the narrator should be of a minimum level of category 5. The Muhaddisin, they have written the history and biography of all the narrators and they have given 12, le 12 levels of, to the narrators. Number 1 is Sikka. All the Sahabas come in the Sikka means the best. Number 1. Truthful. Then 1, 2, 3, 4, last is Khazab. Liar. So if the narrator is up to level 5, it can be counted as hadith which is sahih. Imam Bukhari, he says, in my silsila sahih, in my sahih Bukhari, I will only take narrators up to level 3. That means he is putting a stricter condition. He put it so if Bukhari put additional criteria to make it more authentic, that if it's a hadith in sahih Bukhari, it's a high level. Imam Muslim, who was a student of Imam Bukhari, he put few additional criteria of his own. He said, I will take narrators only up to level 4. 4 and above. Bukhari said 3 and above, 1, 2, 3. Muslim said, I will take up to level 4, I will not take level 5. His additional criteria. So, the Muhaddisin, they say, that number 1, the highest Hadith is that hadith which is muttafiq alike. That means the hadith which was compiled by Bukhari and he said it is sahih in his sahih Bukhari and the hadith which was compiled by Imam Muslim in his sahih Muslim and it occurs in both of them. So if it occurs in sahih Bukhari and in sahih Muslim, it is called as muttafiq alike. That means it is available in both sahih Bukhari and sahih Muslim. And there is a book Lulu al Marjan that has collection of all the hadith which occurs in both Bukhari and Muslim. So that is number one. The hadith that is present in both Bukhari and Muslim, that is the highest level number one. Number two is the hadith which are present in Sahih Bukhari. Number three are the hadith which are present in Sahih Muslim. Number four, the Muhaddisin they say that Imam Bukhari was not able to analyze all the hadith. The Muhaddisin say that approximately today, there are approximately 1 million hadith. And Bukhari memorized approximately 6 lakh hadith, 600,000 hadith. So the Muhaddisin say that those hadith which Imam Bukhari did not analyze, we are analyzing and applying the criteria of Bukhari. Then the Muhaddisin they say that those hadith which Imam Muslim did not analyze, we are applying the criteria of Imam Muslim on those hadith which Imam Muslim did not analyze and we are telling this fulfill this criteria. So number four is the hadith which Imam Bukhari did not analyze, the other Muhaddisin analyzed and which Imam Muslim did not analyze and the other Muhaddisin applied the criteria of Imam Muslim analyzed and it's matching both the criteria of Imam Bukhari 
an Imam Muslim, but these Imam did not analyze themselves. That is number four. Number five is those hadith which Imam Bukhari did not analyze, but fulfilled the criteria of Imam Bukhari. That comes to number number five. Number six is those hadith which Imam Muslim did not analyze, but fulfilled the criteria of Imam Muslim, analyzed by, uh, by the other muhaddisin. That comes at level six. In Imam Bukhari, as I mentioned, there are 7,563 hadith. Even in Sahih Muslim, there are 7,563 hadith. The numbering differs in different editions. So this is level 6. Level 7 is a Sahih hadith with continuous chain which doesn't fulfill the criteria of Bukhari and Muslim which fulfills the normal criteria of Sahih Hadith which I discussed, five criteria of Sahih Hadith, but it is a continuous chain. Number eight is a Sahih Hadith fulfilling the criteria, five criteria of Sahih Hadith, but it is a broken chain. Number nine is Hassan Hadith, a little bit doesn't fulfill, 100% of Sahih, but very close to it, with a continuous chain, that is number seven. Hassan Hadith with a continuous chain. And the tenth category is Hassan Hadith with the broken chain. So these are the ten categories of Sai Hadith. This science of Hadith, it is very vast. And believe me, if you compare to how the historians approve any historical fact, and they say, okay, this is historically correct. There is a criteria which normal non-Muslim historians when they agree that this is a historical fact. But the criteria put by the Muhaddisin for a Hadith to be say is multiple times more stricter. It is multiple times more difficult. It is multiple times more stringent as what the historians do. That's the reason if for a Hadith to be Sahih, we'll, I just told you the brief of it. It's not that easy. Every narrator, his history has been written. There's a Rijal, all in detail. It is so difficult. It is such a minute study that if the Mohaddisin, when they give a verdict, they can be a minor difference. They cannot be someone saying it's a very high category, someone saying Saif and the other saying Maudu, it's not possible. It may differ level one hadith or level two. One or two level may differ, that's it. If authentic, good Mohaddisin, they refer and they check. So this is the science of hadith. It is not possible for a layman or a person like me, who is just a student of knowledge. I cannot decipher whether say say or say. I have read about the criteria, but I am not qualified at all. So this, to, to classify whether the hadith is sahih or zaif or maudu or which level of sahih, it is the work of a muhaddith specialization. And in the recent time, one of the famous muhaddiths, as I mentioned, was Sheikh Nasruddin Albani and he has done a great job Sheikh Nasruddin Albani and the question which when I studied with Sheikh Ziaur Rahman Azmi may Allah grant him Jannah that when we talk about Quran and Sahih Hadith we don't have all the Sahih Hadith compiled the maximum I could do I studied with him in, in the year 1997 we could say okay <laughs> Takes in Salah Sahih, but that doesn't have all the Sahih Hadith. It contains the Sahih Hadith in Qutb Sitta only. Bukhari Muslim and the other four books. So, Alhamdulillah, after Sheikh Ziyar Rahman asked me, he retired. There are many scholars in the last 1400 years who tried to compile all the Sahih Hadith together in one volume, but all those who tried, they never completed the project. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Ziyar Rahman asked me, after he retired, it took him about 17 to 18 years to complete this project and he compiled all the Sahih together and he compiled in a book called as jam e kamil Al-Hadith As-Sahih As-Shamil. The full name is jam al jam al kamil Al-Hadith As-Sahih As-Shamil. Short form it's called as jam e kamil And about four years ago, he compiled it and the first edition was published and 
after it was published the revision was done about two years before and it was printed just in this year and alhamdulillah after the second edition was printed and published and Sheikh Ziyar Rehman Azmi he checked it up and he was happy that at least the revised edition was out it though he wrote the manuscript in 20 volumes it was printed the first edition in in uh, 12 volumes the second edition because the, the print was larger it came in 18 volumes he also made a muqtasar jame kamil in five volumes in the original jame kamil as Sheikh Zaraman Azmi said there were more than a million hadith out of the million hadith there are many duplicates like in Sahih Bukhari if you remove the duplicates there are 2220 hadith so if you take if you compile all the one million hadith and remove the duplicates according to Sheikh Zaraman and Azmin they were about 60,000 hadith from the 60,000 hadith he collected only the Sahih hadith removing the duplicate and in his Jame Kamil there are 16,546 hadith so according to Sheikh Zia Rahman Azmin, after removing the duplicates, the Sai Hadith today in the world are 16,546. And we can safely say, if not 100%, at least this compilation of his, at least minimum, contains 95% of the Sai Hadith. In this compilation, he has given the Hujja, he has his own criteria, he compiled all the Hadith which are Sai and removed the duplicate. He gave a reason that if this hadith was sahih and according to him it was zaif he even mentioned that outside is jame kamil so there are additional 3000 hadith which other scholars say it is sahih but he says it is zaif and he gives hujja why it is zaif and he mentions it so that people don't think he has forgotten then he has even added in that 3000 hadith the very common hadith famous hadith but they are zaif famous hadith which are maudu for example the very common and famous hadith that ikhtilaf is arhama it's a daif hadith it, it is a maudu hadith there's another maudu hadith that as far as you go to acquire knowledge no problem even if you go to china china was never the seat of knowledge at the time of the prophet the hadith is maudu so he mentioned this famous hadith but it did not say hadith it is a maudu and giving his reason so totally jame kamil contained 16546 hadith plus approximately 3000 hadith which other muhaddisin has said say and he says it is zaif or the other famous hadith which are zaif and maudu so people don't think he has missed out and in this the big volume which is printed in 12 volume in the first edition it in the second edition this has given the takhrik the details why it is say why it is zaif and all the reasoning and if the hadith is there he gives the references there in say bukhari Hadith number so and so, including say Muslim hadith number so and so, including Abu Dawud hadith number so and so. So after the end of every hadith, has, it is available in three books of hadith, or well, five books of hadith, or two books of hadith, or only one book of hadith. The details are given so that you come to know from where it comes. In the Muqtasar, Jame Kamil, which is in five volume, the takhrij, the research has been removed so that it's easy for a layman to read. So the the complete Jame Kamil is mainly for scholars and for the Mohaddisin. For a layman, the Muqtasar is sufficient. The Muqtasar, we have started translating it into English. It was a three years project. We started it about four years back. But unfortunately, when the translation was complete, I was then happy with the English language. So we are revising it. So now we have completed one third of the revision. Inshallah, next year, by the end of next year, it will be out. So we will, inshallah, translate the Muqtasar which is in five volumes and it will be easy for people who don't know Arabic to read it and to understand it we are translating also into Urdu and other languages we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this work is a phenomenal work so when we say Quran and say Hadith now you can say Quran and Jami Kamil Jami Kamil contains all the Hadith of Bukhari all the Hadith of Muslim all the Sahih Hadith which is there in the Qutb al-Sitta in Abu Dawood, in, in Sunan Nisai, in uh, Sunan Tirmidhi, in Ibn Majah, Muatta Malik. There are other books of Sahih. The other books of Sahih that we know that Bukhari and Muslim are only two books which are 100% authentic. And scholars even say that Imam Muatta Malik, all Sahih. So for a layman, if he wants to know 
he cannot do research. If the Hadith of Bukhari or Muslim or Imam Mu'atta Malik safely he can say the Hadith is Sahih. Otherwise, he has to check whether it is Sahih or not. <clears throat> there were other books of Hadith compiled by scholars saying it's completely Sahih, but the scholars don't agree everything is Sahih. After Bukhari and Muslim, there is a compilation of Sayyid ibn Khuzayma. According to Suyuti, Sayyid ibn Khuzayma, after Bukhari Muslim, there are some hadiths which scholars say is not Sahih, but it comes in the third level. The fourth is Sayyid ibn Habban. Then there is the fifth book is Mustadak al Hakim. He also claims everything is Sahih, but the scholars differ and they say that everything is not Sahih. So these three books compiled as everything is Sahih is most of them, almost all are Sahih, but not everything. In the other Qutb sitta the four books, it, when Imam Dawood, when he compiled, his main objective wasn't to compile only Sahih Hadith. His objective was to compile Hadith which solves matter of Salah or of Wudu or of other aspects. Same with the other Muaddithin, Imam Nasai, um, uh, Imam, uh, Imam Tirmidhi or Imam Ibn Majah. Their purpose wasn't to compile Sahih. Majority are Sahih. So that's the reason all they themselves mentioned in the collection that this Hadith is Sahih. They have done that. But for a layman, for him to know Hadith is Sahih, if it's a hadith of Bukhari or a Muslim, it is safe to call it Sahih. Or if it's a hadith which is there in Imam Mu'atta Malik, it is safe to be Sahih. Any other hadith, he has to go and check up what have the Muhaddithin said. And then he can decipher whether it is Sahih or not. This was in brief what I've mentioned. It is just scratching the surface. It is just scratching the surface on the science of hadith. We have not... It's a huge science. Because of this, we know today, Alhamdulillah, all the minute details of the last and final messenger, our beloved Prophet Muhammad There is no human being on the face of the earth which has, whose life has been preserved with so minute detail. It is all because of the hadith that we have and, and when Allah says, uh, when, when Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hijr, chapter number 15, verse number 9, that we have revealed the Quran and we shall guide from corruption. The word here used is zikr. It surely means the Quran. And many of the Muhaddis and scholars say it also includes the Sahih Hadith. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Quran, we give him the zikr and also the Sahih Hadith. And he will see to it that he protects it. This was in short about Sahih Hadith and Sahih Bukhari. Now we run out of time, so we end the session here and inshallah we will meet again next Saturday at the same time and for the next 6th or 7th session I will be handling alone. My son will inshallah join, Farik would join in the first session in January after his exam. He is appearing for his final exam for his bachelor's in Sharia in Jamit al-Imam in Riyadh. He, the exam will be getting over it towards the end of December and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may he be successful in his exams of bachelors of Sharia. Inshallah till we meet next at the same time next Saturday at 11.30 time of Malaysia, 6.30 Makkah time, 3.30 GMT for the program as Dr. Zakir. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa akhru dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.